must be here for the tour. Come on in. Hi, I'm Pastor Steve, and welcome to New North Church. We decided to put together a virtual church tour for everyone who lives away, or if you just are not going out. So join us on our tour. Let's take a quick 360 degree tour of our sanctuary. In 1806, what was then known as the Third Congregational Society built what they called a meeting house, though it doesn't follow the meeting house style prevalent at the time. According to the Reverend Douglas Showalter, early congregational meeting houses in New England were either square or rectangular, with the pulpit and entry door on opposite long walls of the rectangle. New North Church is an early example of a meeting house built in the so-called church style. The difference is that while meeting houses have their pulpit and main entry on opposite long walls, church-style houses of worship have them on the short walls of the rectangle. In both styles, the Roos Ridge line follows this alignment. New North also represents a departure from conventional designs and construction methods. The building includes elements of the Greek temple form and makes use of proportional guidelines to set major width and height dimensions. This design helped influence what has since become a traditional church form. Hingham has a long church history and enjoys a rich church tradition, as we will see at the end of the tour. Here is a view of the main aisle in the sanctuary. One long and robust beam runs under the floor all the way from the pulpit to the double doors we just came through. Now here's another view from one of the side pews. These are the oldest pews in Hingham, and you can see the way the pine has weathered. Each pew door is numbered, and each pew was purchased on an annual basis. In this way, the original pew owners raised the money to build the place. You can still buy a pew today. The money raised is used to help pay our insurance bill. Here's a close-up of Pew 7, Benjamin Lincoln's pew. Scattered around the church are pews owned by veterans of the War of Independence, people such as Canterbury Barnes, Jerome Cushing, Reuben Stodder, and Peter Loring, to name just a few. Jar Jairus Levitt, the son of a notorious loyalist, also owned a pew here. So people with opposite views sitting together for Sunday worship is very much in keeping with who we are today. We honor Benjamin Lincoln, John Albion Andrew, and John Davis Long with plaques in their pews. Here is a period drawing showing an overhead view of the original pulpit. It was replaced with a mahogany pulpit in 1832, which is still in use in today. Now we come to one of my favorite photos. This one came to us from Kent Noble, a longtime New North Church member and supporter. This photo probably dates to before 1892. It's before the 1906 edition for sure. The painting on the back wall dominates the view. That's a Trump loyal painting. Everything you see is paint. Replicating that today, I cannot imagine what it would cost. Several things to notice in the photo. On the back wall, in, right there in the columns, the painted columns and on the side walls, are lighting sconces. So there's electricity here. Also, you can see the stove pipes running on either side of the balcony, which provided heat in the winter. See that chair and table right down there in the center? Those are still in use today. If this photo dates to before 1892, they're about 128 years old now. Also, 
the side pews on either side of the pulpit. On the right-hand side, that window is still in place, but most of those pews are gone. One free pew was removed before 1859. That's immediately to the right of the pulpit in this photo. And then three pews on either side were also removed in 1892. So that's why I say this photo dates to before that, because they're still here. The remainder were removed in 1902 on the far left, where that window is now a door, and that whole area is opened up to provide access to the 1906 edition. Also, the first two pews in the center section, so the one on the left and the one on the right, they were also removed at the same time to open up some space. It's a remarkable photograph, and it's, like I said, one of my favorites. Now here's the back wall as it appears today. Notice that that woodwork is all real. It's not painted as it was originally, and I can't tell you when it was installed, but it's less than 100 years old. This is the view high above the sanctuary from the servant galleries. And as you can see, it's a great view and we're pretty high up. In the summertime, it would be hot and steamy up here, but in the winter, it would be warm and toasty. On the edges, we have benches and there's the staircase heading down to the organ loft. The bench on this side with a nice curve to it. It would be a mistake to call these slave galleries because slavery in Massachusetts no longer existed at the time that this church was built. Although architectural segregation did exist and people of color were up here. There was a, a gallery for the men on one side and women on the other. And the last person of color up here was Lucretia Leonard. And we've talked about her before. She was up here until early in the 1840s when her three employers, the three Thaxter sisters, petitioned the pastor at the time, Oliver Stearns, for Lucretia to come down and join them. She did, and she stayed down in the sanctuary until she died in 1904. She outlived everyone in the church that day, and she is buried in Hingham Cemetery. The original organ was replaced in 1849 when a contract was made with George Stevens for a new organ, which cost $1,200. This instrument is the one still in use today, following a rebuild in 1973. A box structure featuring non-functional bronze-colored pipes dominates the area above the vestibule. All the functional pipes are hidden behind this structure. You can't see them, but you can feel their presence, as our organist, Kathy Morrison, makes clear in the following clip. This is a piece by Andre Kamprock. I don't know if I should talk about the organ, but... Sure. Um, Most people watching... Uh, wouldn't have any clue as to all those buttons you're pushing. Oh, well, you know what? Why don't I make a few sounds so they can hear what these buttons sound? Is that all right? Sure. All right. We have pipes that are certain lengths. A 16 is deep. It's, it's uh, mostly a pedal note, 16 foot pipe. The next one would be an 8 foot. So, 
kind of mid-range. Yep, and then we have a four foot. Huh. Um, is a 15th, I don't know if that works, is it that this? Two feet. Oh. Yeah. Like a piccolo. Yes, yes. It's fun, really. What I usually play for the congregation to sing depends on how many people there are. So for here, um, I would play probably, let's see, what are we going to do on this? And now we are even higher than the organ loft. We're now above the ceiling. And this first shot actually is in the clock room, the clock tower. You can see the cross bracing here going back and forth. Also, you can see the pegs used in the mortise and tenon construction. In the deep background, you can see the electronics for the cell phone tower, which is way up above. We are a telecommunications facility. We're not just a church. In this shot, you can see a vertical strut and the cross bracing there holding up the, the ridge for the roof. And you can see there the more peg construction. Here's the same thing in a close-up view. Some of the beams are numbered as you work your way along the catwalk above the ceiling of the church, there are vertical and horizontal beams and they're fitted together and they're all numbered to make sure it goes together as designed. Here's a shot of the roof. This is the sloping part of the, the roof from the ridge line down to the gutters. And you can see again, more cross bracing and more heavy construction. The next thing we'll do is go up and visit the clock room. Hello, I'm Ross Hochstrasser. I run uh, Ross Hochstrasser Clock Service, for, uh, Clock Repair and Restoration Service in Whitman, Massachusetts. And we're here at the New North Church in Hingham, Massachusetts. And uh, this is a 1906 vintage E. Howard striking tower clock that uh, we did a complete restoration on back in 2017. Uh, this entire mechanism was disassembled, cleaned, polished, painted, and uh, lubricated and reassembled uh, in the course of, over the course of a few months. And uh, you can hear it ticking in the, in the background. And uh, um, we also, at the same time, refurbished the dial train mechanisms and made a few modifications on those to allow for uh, thermal expansion of the building and uh, new cables were strung. This uh, strike train uh, is driven by about a 650 pound granite block uh, that hangs on a pulley at the other end of the building and the time mechanism runs on about 150 pounds of weight that hangs right behind where I'm sitting here. Um, the clock has been running now for three years and keeping time pretty well I believe and uh, um, it uh, drives four six-foot diameter faces on the outside of the building. The 
The pendulum is 8 feet long and weighs 75 pounds and is uh, supported by a cherry uh, rod and it hangs on a little spring at the very top that allows it to swing back and forth. And this is the escapement right here. You can see my finger pointing to it. This is called the escape wheel. This is called the verge. You can see the verge is rocking back and forth, which is where we get the expression being on the verge of uh, doing something because the verge is swinging back and forth. And uh, I guess it would be emblematic of uh, you being unable to make a decision, I suppose. But the, the 75 pound pendulum is actually being pushed a little bit every time you hear a click here at the escapement. And um, the pendulum is the timekeeping element of the clock. Uh, and changing the length of the pendulum changes the timekeeping rate. And uh, I don't know if you can see this knob up here, but this is, this is where we adjust the timekeeping rate. There's a coarse adjustment down on the bottom of the pendulum, and a fine one here. Rotating this little knob changes the timekeeping rate very slightly. But there are many of these tower clocks still in operation. Uh, there's also an awful lot of them that have been electrified. Uh, fortunately, this one escaped any electrification over the years, thank, thank goodness. But um, we uh, try to keep them original and operational as they were originally intended by the E. Howard Clock Company. Uh, and this clock was made in Boston, not far from here. And uh, an interesting note about this and many of the clocks of its type, uh, when we take them apart and remove them from the building, it's probably the first time they've been in a motorized vehicle. This clock was pr probably delivered by a horse and buggy uh, back in the early 1900s when it was installed. This clock was a replacement for an earlier clock. Uh, we don't really know anything about the earlier clock, but um, it, uh, uh, the dial trains that hold the hands are original to the building and are original to the first clock. They weren't changed to E. Howard equipment when this clock was put in. Um, but uh, there's no, no uh, written information anyhow on what the original clock was. There were a number of manufacturers in Massachusetts. Uh, the one at the uh, Old South Meeting House in Boston was made by Galen Brown. Uh, there were also a Parker family that made a lot of uh, some of the early, early American tower clocks. So the clock gets wound once a week and uh, we have somebody here that's going to tell us about that and uh, we'll uh, hand it over to the clock winder. Hello, my name is Horatio Hemmings. I'm an employee for the town of Hingham, and I'm here to demonstrate how to wind the clock at New North Church. Um, what you have here is the bell and then the clock. As you notice, there is two um, adjacent pieces sticking out that we're going to use to wind the bell. here and then that would also go on here to wind the clock it takes approximately about a half an hour for me to do the bell and the clock and once it's done I do it the following week once a week thank you for joining us and I uh, look forward to seeing you in church soon. Amen. As mentioned earlier, the building was expanded in 1906 with the addition of a parlor and a ballroom. More recently, we have added this new kitchen. This goes back about 10 years. Brand new, thoroughly modern, and it's something that you don't miss until you have it, and the thing is fantastic. We thank God for it, and it was a wonderful gift to the church. 
Here's a view of the ballroom looking toward the Palladium window. And in the far distance, you can see a platform, which is kind of like a nice little alcove for parties or, or whatnot. We have dance classes here, yoga classes, um, ballroom dancing. And this is looking toward the stage. And we've had rock concerts here in my memory. <laughs> it was quite loud but a lot of fun. Here's a view of the corner of the parlor. This is the Ruth Cosgrove Curry Parlor. And that tall case clock in the corner was made by John Bailey II. And it was presented to the New North Parish House in memory of Clara Barnes on March 9th, 1905. To the far left and out of view, are portraits of Benjamin Lincoln and his wife, Mary Cushing. These were donated by Rose and her brother, Rose Woodard, and her brother, Franklin Beveridge. Um, Rose is a Lincoln descendant, and she and her husband, Charles, owned the Benjamin Lincoln House across Fountain Square. We sometimes use the parlor in the winter. Um, we heat it up with this fireplace and we save some money by not heating the sanctuary. And that money goes into a fuel assistance program that we've done for many years. And service to others has been an integral part of the church since its inception. The inscription above the fireplace was written by Governor Long. He was a longtime member here, and he served as governor of Massachusetts and as secretary of the Navy. All in all, everything we have here is a gift, and we appreciate it greatly. Hello again, Pastor Steve. This time I'm up on top of the bell tower, the very top of the steeple. So the cupola is above me, but that's about it. And I'm here to close out our tour to thank you for being here and for supporting us. Thanks for watching. Go in peace. From this vantage point up on the bell tower, we can see down the street the North Street Community Chapel, Church of the Nazarene. And as we come around, looking down North Street, we have our neighbor, St. Paul's Catholic Church, but also from here you can see the steeples for First Parish, the Old Chip, First Baptist Church, and then further down Main Street we have St. John the Evangelist Episcopal Church, Hingham Congregational Church, South Shore Baptist Church, Second Parish Church, the House of Prayer Lutheran Church, Resurrection Church, Congregation Shirai Shalom, and then down some side streets, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on Gardner Street and Glastonbury Abbey on the other side of 228. Thank you all so much. Bye.